Hi, my name's Tom. If you've been a subscriber to the channel for a while, you'll know that one of my favorite passions is tractors. And I like all tractors. I think I was born with a tractor in my hand. I grew up on a small farm here in Southern Maine and my collection of toy tractors, tractor memorabilia, tractor everything, accumulated pretty, pretty heavily over the years. And over the last year or so, I've uh, moved a lot of it out of here. I just thought maybe it was time for it to find a new home. But today I want to talk to you about red tractors in particular and the two red tractors I'm going to talk about are the Farmall Cup and the Farmall 140. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of both, what their differences are, and while I do like all tractors, red tractors in particular are nearest and dearest to my heart. This tractor behind me is a 1948 Cub. It's exactly like the one my dad bought brand new when he got out of the Navy in World War II. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the variations of the Cub. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the, the variations of the 140. So stick around. I hope you'll be as entertained and that you like tractors even a little bit as much as I do. Sometimes I feel like I'm a collector and purveyor of junk, but I have all these original IH brochures. And so this right here is a late model. International Cub. This is known as the Long Stripe. With the Long Stripes, I think those started in 1975. John Deere made their brochures a little bit easier to read because down here in the corners it would show, uh, you know, say AD, and then it'd have like the month and the two of the year. But this one also says 875 on it, so that tells me this was came out in August 1975. Uh, and but this is the Long Stripe version of it. The 84, 184 was, was essentially the same tractor, but it had a lot more horsepower. And so this one here doesn't have a date on it. And that was about the time they, they changed them all to yellow. So this right here, here's some more of the Cub brochures. So here's the International Cub. And again, it's got the, the small decal on it. Now these are here with the low boys that came out in the early 60s. It's got the small decal on it, but yellow and white. And by this point, international biggest customer for these tractors was the homeowner and the, the very small farmer, but primarily they were municipalities, state highway departments, hospitals, schools, etc. And you can see, when I go back here to the 185 and look at the Cub Cadet. So the, the reason this was restyled was to be similar to this. They wanted them to have, you know, look like they were in the same family and they really are similar. Look at how the nose sticks out on these. This right here is a 1958 to I think 62 or yeah 62 because they were yellow in 62. And this right here has the, the four bar grill on it which was introduced in 1958 and that made uh, the, the Cub looked more like the uh, 460 560s. This right here is a, a Farmall 140. You can see it says McCormick Farmall 140. This is one of the earlier ones. The International Harvester dumped the Farmall name for the first time around 1962 or so when they went from the, the Farmall Cub and the International Low Boy to just the International Cub but the Farmall 140. You can see this grill on it here. This came out in 1964 and it also was 12, came out uh, as 12 volts. The, the last year or so of production, International painted them red again. They still had the, the blue and black long stripe and said International Cub on them, but they were back to IH red. And of course you could always special order all your, your, your International Cubs red, but uh, most of them came yellow. And so one of the stories that was told a long time ago was that the Lawn and Garden 
would get the yellow and white and then the, the ag dealers got the reds and whether that's true or not, I don't know. But uh, that's what I've been told. Interestingly, the, the first 140s that came out had this same kind of grill look on it. And I ended up selling one of these noses this past spring that had that, that look on it. And you'd be surprised how much money those, those go for in really good shape. And I really almost fell over my chair when I realized how much people were going to pay me for it. But in 1964, they changed this grill to match the, the 504 706 series bigger tractor so they'd look like they were in the same family. And at that same time, both the Cub and the 140 were changed from 6 to 12 volts. That made it a lot easier starting, particularly in the winter. And you know, one of the, the big key selling points of these offset Cubs in 140s was what they called cultivation, and it sat off to one side, so you had a straight view of the crops. And tobacco, small vegetable growers, and some uh, nurseries also, but you know, Christmas tree farms, etc. Farmers that needed to be able to cultivate their crops, they weren't using Roundup, they had to manually cultivate the crops. Now this right here is, I believe this is around 1945. In 1939, they came out with the A, the H, and the M. And the A was basically the, the new F-14. I am back in the, you know, one of the, what we call the golden age. There was a man named Raymond Lowy. He was from France, uh, an industrial designer. He went to the, to the United States. He was in the, the French army, but he, he immigrated to the United States. In 19... 37, he won awards for a lot of his designs, including the Pennsylvania Railroad, the, the electric locomotive that they, they had. I think it was a CGG1 or something like that. But uh, International Harvester invited him to come up with some prototypes. And so th the one that won was the one you see here. It's one page right here. And so this story really starts with the Farmall A, where, like I said, it was an updated version of the F-14. Interestingly, the A was built in both Chicago, Illinois, and Louisville, Kentucky. One of the options of the A that made it really handy, the H and the M had hydraulic lift all, which basically did away with the mechanical lift that farmers were struggling with before and, and replaced it with hydraulics. Well, hydraulics were still in their, in their relative infancy in the late 30s, early 40s. International Harvester experimented what they called pneumatic lift all, or uh, a lot of people call it a vacuum lift. And basically what it did was took exhaust and ran it through a can and expanded a cylinder and retracted a cylinder. Similar, usually go about one third and then we should start right up. There are a lot of different farm all cub, international cub, international groups, farm all 140, 660 groups on Facebook. And one question that I see a lot of times people ask is, which tractor should I buy, a cub or a 140? Well, you know, I'm gonna show you the differences right now, close up. Personally, I, I like the 140 better. It's more of a robust tractor. And I'm gonna show you a few of the other features about the 140, which makes me think that it's, it's really, a superior tractor to the Cub. But I'll start with the Cub and go over feature for feature with the Cub and then go to the 140 and show you the same thing. So the same series tractors built around the same time. They were both built in Louisville, Kentucky. Came out of the same plant. Around the time the 100 came out, they stopped building them in Chicago and moved everything to Louisville. Interestingly, they retooled the machines, the machine, the machine shop to build the Farmwell Cub, I think about three times and it finally when they discontinued the Cub again in 1979, uh, the, the machinery, the machine shop was, all the dual, all the dies were worn out again. They made about, I think, 270,000 of these things. The, the Cubs were wildly popular. They were really relatively inexpensive to buy. And by the late 1950s, 
all the competitors like the the Atlas Chalmers C10, the John Deere 420, five, Ford 501, etc. Those tractors were all gone, and this left International alone in this uh, category. It was the only tractor in its size, and they sold a pile of these too. So the the Cub, you can still buy a lot of brand new parts for it. These are wildly popular. You can see I got brand new tires on it, brand new rims. They both have the fast hitch, and while they both take the same size implement, they're just a little bit different. This leveling crank here on the Cub adjusts the pitch fore and aft. On the 140, it's done via the rock shaft on the right. There's a, a bar that goes from there down to the front of the, the draw bar or the front of the fast hitch, and that is done hydraulically. Again, they're, they're pretty similar. The latches are a little bit different. The, the crossbars are a little bit different. You can see that one's about an inch, and that one there is a little bit bigger. Obviously, the, the 140 fast hitch bar is longer. There's an easy way to tell the difference is on the 140 fast hitch. You have all these different adjustments here and on the Cub. You only have three. So what that does is that moves your draw bar left or right and it's primarily used for mold board plows. So the, they both have the deluxe seat, same seat, same cushion, same armrests on both. They're both 12 volt. The Cub is a three-speed transmission and in my mind the three-speed transmission kind of went away as far as usefulness in the 1940s. Everybody else was starting to go with four-speed gearboxes and by the, the 50s and 60s there were five speeds, six speeds, eight speeds. So three-speed it's okay but there just never seems to be a gear that's just right. There's never one quite slow enough, never one quite fast enough. Having said that there was a creeper gear that was uh, available for the Cub and that was usually Installed if you bought a fast hitch Howard rotivator, which was a 28 inch rototiller, and so the creeper speed would be added. And that was just because, well, you only have an 18 horsepower tractor or a 15 horse tractor, and so that tiller used up some power and it just couldn't go fast enough. And you really had to take it slow in order to do a good job. So, three speed versus four speed gearbox, they both had turning brakes. The clutch and brake pedals on the Cub are pretty thin. It's just a quarter inch steel. And then the ones on the 140, they're, they're like they were on the, the Super A. In fact, a lot of the Super A parts carried over. The, the motor obviously was different, but a lot of the attachments would still fit. With the Cub, you only have one touch control unit. So as you can see, I've got a carrier on the back and a blade on the front. Well, there was a latch device that you could buy that would basically hook right there and so I had to use a chain to mimic it and that way I can keep this up and still use the blade otherwise they both go up and down at the same time so it's not super handy. One of the options that came with a Cub or you could buy with a Cub was the spring. This is a cushion spring for the fast hitch. This right here is a flasher, the highway flasher. This came with one. The 140 had two. And they both had a two position or a work light on the back. And the work light would either be on or off. And there was usually a recessed uh, red dot light inside it. So when you were, had your headlights on going down the road at night, there was just a, a little tiny red dot light that would come on. So obviously you have bigger tires. They're the same size rim as far as their 24 inch rims, but much, much bigger tire on the 140. These are 12.424s on here. These are 8.324. So much bigger tire. Front tires, much bigger also. 
is a Goodyear 550-16s. And these are D-Stone 412s. So you have a four inch bigger rim on the front of the 140. Look at the size of the front axle on that 140 compared to the cub. Much bigger tie rods. Now the cub was water cooled. Cubs were always thermosiphoned, which means they didn't have a water pump on them. So you can see on this, this cub right here, you got the crank, and it just goes up to the fan. And then there's another belt on the side that goes to the alternator. And with the cub, the generator and alternator, they're tucked up in here. And whether you have a magneto or a distributor would determine whether you had a cutout or a voltage regulator. This one has a distributor. They, at some point, were optional either way. Both one row tractors, essentially. Both had mounted equipment that could be bought for either. The original dealership decal from 1973. The Cub had it on it when I bought it, and this, after a couple washings, it faded out. But this used to say RS Osgoods up in Dixfield, Maine. This tractor was sold brand new with a sickle bar mower and an LF-194 moldboard plow and a snow plow. This tractor was sold in Savatis, Maine and it came with a rollover hillside plow, a snow plow, a sickle bar mower, a cordwood saw, International Harvester dealership in Alfred, Maine and, and sitting on one just like this in 1978 So I would have been six and my dad and brother were, were in there talking about buying a new cub They didn't end up buying a cub uh, the next year. My brother bought that Super C used And the 140 obviously we've had one on the farm since I was I think 12 at some point the 140s they went to a an actual spin-on oil filter that was original. You can buy an adapter kit for it. I've heard people had good luck with them, but they're expensive and obviously they're not original. Use the canister. So the, the Cub's a great little tractor to take in parades, haul a little trailer around. There's a planter and, and of course cultivators. A lot of people use them for, for their gardens and the Cub takes up a lot less space than the 140, so that's definitely a plus. Really available for the Cub still. One drawback about the Cub, though, is the power takeoff. It's splined differently, and it goes the wrong way. And that was designed that way on purpose, so you wouldn't confuse this little 9 or 10 horse tractor with an A or an H or an M or something much bigger. The 140 had an adjustable seat. The Cub really didn't. In 1955, the Cub went from 9 PTO horsepower to 10 PTO horsepower to 1800 RPMs. So in 1955, they restyled the Cub and that made it look like the 100, 200, 300, 400 series tractors. You can see the grill's different. Basically, the only thing really different was the, the hood and the grill. One thing about the Cubs is the tank and the hood are all one piece and then the lights are hooked on there. And so there's two holes in the top and that's to oil the generator. You can reach around the side and get to the spark plugs to change the spark plugs, but if you really want to do much engine maintenance besides, well, you, you can actually, like I said, you can change the spark plugs, you can get the plug wires, and you can change the oil without taking this all off. But if you need to really get in there and work on the motor to do much else, like change any of the belts or anything, you have to disconnect the, the fuel and some of the wiring, get the headlights off, and then this whole thing comes off. You also have to unhook these dog legs here and those things can be a real bear to get off you can unhook it on the top or down bottom but a lot of times they end up breaking the screws off inside the, the cast block and then it's really a real pain in the butt to get that tapped out and, and uh, usable again 
around 1950, there was an agricultural exposition and International Harvester in an effort to get more publicity for their farm oil cub, the A and the C. They painted them white. There was some red and some black on them still, but they were mostly white and they had some special cardboard cutouts on them and a few extra decals. And the way you can tell if a cup is a demonstrator, it's because it's between serial numbers 99356 and 106516. What was supposed to happen is after the, the dealership was done at the expo or done with the, the sales event, they were supposed to repaint them red. Some, some didn't, some were sold white and a lot of tractor restorers have realized that they had a white cup and then they've removed the red paint and painted it white again. There's really nothing significantly different about the white cup other than the paint and a few cardboard cutouts and a decal or two. One of the reasons they switched the yellow was because they were used in, like I said, in industrial applications and yellow was a little bit more visible and just had more of an industrial look to it. Of course, red was always an option on these tractors. You could always, always, always order your international tractor, international red. I think it was around 1967, there was a bunch of cubs similar to this one right here that were painted just a little bit different. The hood and grill and wheels were white, but the all the body that's yellow on this tractor was painted IH red. So it was a red and white tractor. It was a really a beautiful looking tractor. Uh, I believe they were supposed to go to some place in Canada, but the deal fell through. And so all those tractors just kind of made their way to different locations around the eastern seaboard. And even to this day, there's still quite a few of those around and they are very highly collectible. To my knowledge, there's not a serial, num serial number range for those red and white cubs. Low Boy was first introduced in 1953. And the way they did that was by just taking the standard uh, rear axle housing of the regular cub and rotating it forward and that lowered it about seven inches and then the front axle they lowered those spindles and the wheelbase was shortened to 62 and a half inches and so that made it a lot more maneuverable for mowing and also for getting under doorways and trees and stuff like that one interesting thing about the uh, the farm oil cub is there was a bunch of these that were made in france and they were just called the uh, the French Cup, French Super Cup. They looked pretty much like this. They had some uh, copyright problems, so they had like McCormick Farmall International Cup on it. It was it was pretty interesting. And those were made between 1958 and 1964. The Super A1, there were 1,672 built, and that was 21 PTO horsepower and it had the C123 engine instead of the C113. So which one's better? A Super A 100, 130, 140 or a Cub? Both? Hopefully this video has been mildly entertaining to those of you who have watched. I really appreciate all your time and attention. As always, I appreciate your commentary down below. Thanks for watching and I hope you have a great day.